everyone, my name is Sama and welcome to Mediocre Guidance. After impulsively making videos on whatever the heck I wanted, it's time to bring back the course once again. Thank you for watching my other tomfoolery in the meantime. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about the vision of Christ, which, not gonna lie, still makes me cringe a little to say because when I hear the word Christ, I automatically think Jesus Christ, which means Christianity, and then I get flashbacks of being dragged to youth groups despite my better judgment and being told over the phone that I'm going to burn in hell if I don't convert. Yes, folks, you heard that right. When I was 13 years old, one of my very good friends told me over the phone that she was worried about me because I identified with another religion at the time. I want to clarify that I wasn't even practicing that religion, but my exotic name suggested that I was. As such, she told me that my chosen religion was a cancer within me and that she didn't want me to go to hell. Huh? I want to be clear that I'm not against Christianity, or any religion for that matter. In fact, I believe that many of them uphold some very important truths. I am, however, against fanaticism, and that does not discriminate. There seem to always be those who act as judge, jury, and executioner in all religious societies. That doesn't mean the whole lot are bad people. Please remember this. In fact, even fanatics genuinely believe they are helping. They believe that this is what is right and good, which is why they feel so passionately about leading others onto the correct path. I mean, who am I to judge these people? I'm literally on YouTube right now, preaching about my own beliefs. Remember, and I will say this like a broken record, we are all the son of God, meaning we are all one. Fanatics, even those who look like they've gone off the deep end, are also worthy of our love and compassion. They have simply been given a different moral compass, one that was likely taught to them from a very early age. Their origins are still innocent, since no one is born with their beliefs. They grow up with them. These people genuinely believe they are doing what's right, because that's what's been taught to them. Of course, their definition of right is not the same as everyone else's, and when coupled with isolation and extremism, this can result in a group with some very dangerous notions of what it means to be right. On the other hand, I've had people in my life impose their beliefs on me, and even they don't know why. I once briefly dated a guy in university who told me if we got married, I would have to change my name to one that satisfied his religious mother. <laughs> you can probably guess how long the relationship lasted after that conversation. He was actually pretty chill otherwise, so sometimes, people don't even know why they're abiding by a certain code. They just do it because their parents did it before them. Alright, so let's take a look at the course now to see why we should love these sorts of people anyway, along with everyone else of course. Perception is a function of the body, and therefore represents a limit on awareness. Perception sees through the body's eyes, and hears through the body's ears. I've introduced you to perception and talked about it in length in my previous videos. So as a quick recap, what we perceive through our five senses, whether that's imagery or listening to conversation, is illusory in two ways. Firstly, what we are sensing is not real. It's all a projection created from the mind of the Son of God. So everything around you is like a very immersive movie or video game. Secondly, not only is the matter around us not real, our senses are also interpreting the information coming in through a subjective lens, the lens of our lives. This is totally just a personal opinion, but I've worked in customer service for over 15 years, and with all due respect, old people are the greatest examples of perception. They've accumulated enough life experience that, depending on what they went through, they are either super grumpy or super nice. It's like in their later years, they finally decided whether the world is a good or bad place, and they react accordingly. This has nothing to do with any other socioeconomic factors, by the way. I've seen seniors living well below the poverty line being the sweetest, kindest people, while rich, well-educated snobs are walking around hating on everyone, or any other combination of life circumstances for that matter. Let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree, but I'm just saying the elderly either have the most chill or none at all. Only minds can really join, and whom God has joined, no man can put asunder. It is, however, only at the level of Christ mind that true union is possible, and has, in fact, never been lost. So the Course is calling us to understand that there has actually never been a separation between you, I, and Bob over there. We already are, and always have been, united, and this whole concept of us as separate individuals is just a collective dream we're all sharing in. So we're looking at going from a dualistic view of reality to one of non-dualism. 
This concept that we are all from the same source and that we, in fact, are that source itself is what the Course calls Christ. Basically, Christ is God and all the extensions of God, which is us. We are simply an extension of one. The opposite of seeing through the body's eyes is the vision of Christ, which reflects strength rather than weakness, unity rather than separation, and love rather than fear. The opposite of hearing through the body's ears is communication through the voice for God, the Holy Spirit, which abides in each of us. Now, I've suggested previously that we should all listen to the Holy Spirit within us, but what does that even mean? What does the Holy Spirit sound like? I've wrestled with this question a lot because I am in no way clairaudient or clairvoyant or any other form of psychic, which honestly is kind of rude. Like, I always thought that because I've taken an interest in God, I should unlock some kind of reward in time, like being able to hear him. Like, I should be evolving like a Pokemon into some enhanced being, right? But as I go through life, I realize that the voice is usually my own. And listening to my own voice has more to do with my own self-imposed limitations than anything else. As Rumi once said, your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. Likewise, the Course says the following. His voice seems distant and difficult to hear because the ego, which speaks for the little separated self, seems to be much louder. This is actually reversed. The Holy Spirit speaks with unmistakable clarity and overwhelming appeal. No one who does not choose to identify with the body could possibly be deaf to his messages of release and hope, nor could he fail to accept joyously the vision of Christ in glad exchange for his miserable picture of himself. I've learned that our job is not to try and hear the Holy Spirit, but instead to try and remove those doubts within us that pull us away from our intuition. Those thoughts like, I can't trust myself, or I'm not important enough for God, or that was just coincidence. We're already guided, but we've learned to brush it off because it defies logic or goes against what we think we know. Honestly, I've been using the whole fake it till you make it thing, and I feel like I'm making good progress and getting better at trusting myself to make the right choices. I have a little trick I use that comes from the book The Choice for Love by Dr. Barbara DeAngelis. She suggests to ask yourself the following question whenever you're at a crossroads. What would be the most loving thing to do? Sometimes that means loving yourself and enforcing boundaries. Other times it means swallowing your pride and making amends with another, even if you know you're right. We should also strive to practice true forgiveness, which is the ability to see the innocence in everyone around you, with the understanding that any attack is simply a cry for help. When we combine love and forgiveness, we are able to see past the illusion we've created. Christ's vision is the Holy Spirit's gift, God's alternative to the illusion of separation and to the belief in the reality of sin, guilt, and death. It is the one correction for all errors of perception, the reconciliation of the seeming opposites on which this world is based. Its kindly light shows all things from another point of view, reflecting the thought system that arises from knowledge and making return to God not only possible but inevitable. What was regarded as injustice done to one by someone else now becomes a call for help and for union. Sin, sickness, and attack are seen as misperceptions, calling for remedy through gentleness and love. Defenses are laid down, because where there is no attack, there is no need for them. Our brother's needs become our own, because they are taking the journey with us as we go to God. Without us, they would lose their way. Without them, we could never find our own. Choosing love is acknowledging our true nature as a divine unity. Choosing love is the act of removing the veil of projection in front of us. When you love yourself and others as if they are extensions of God, because they are, the Holy Spirit will nudge you in undeniable ways, and you will start to experience miracles. Others may consider them coincidences, but you will know in your heart that your determination to love is working, and that you are the one bringing us heaven on earth. Thanks for watching, fam. I'll see you next time on Mediocre Guidance.